All right, I think it's time. So welcome, welcome one and all. A very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, uh, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you for you know being here. Uh, this is uh, us trying to recap a very big release that we started out the year with. Uh, so this is our R1 2023 release of all things Teleric and Kendo UI and our productivity tools. Uh, and here today, we are gonna talk about all things Fiddler just more and uh, reporting. So thank you for being here. Uh, welcome on board. Uh, let's uh, get this thing rolling. Um, so hello everyone again. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Sam, and with me I have uh, three of my good friends uh, who are experts on uh, specific things that they're going to talk about. So why don't we go around and uh, do some introductions, uh, starting with Simona first. Hi everyone, thanks Sam for in the introduction. Uh, my name is Simona uh, and I am the product manager of uh, the Fiddler family of products. Um, I've been with the Fiddler team for I think two years almost now and I'm just uh, yeah excited to dive into all productivity stuff that we're about to show you today. Nice, and Eve? Hi everyone, I'm Eve Terzillo and I work on the TechRel team with Sam. I'm excited to join a great group of my colleagues here today to showcase some of the really cool features in R1. We gave a little bit of a tidbit when I was with Simona a few weeks ago in Bulgaria, but we have some more to share and we're going to dive deeper like we promised. Absolutely, and Rick. Hi Sam and everyone in TV land. Uh, I'm Rick Helwich, Principal Sales Engineer. Um, I'll be talking about reporting as usual and just mock this time around. So I think it's going to be a fun show. Cool. All right. And uh, folks, uh, while you see, you know, just the four of us here on screen and on camera, there is, you know, a big group of people supporting us. Uh, so we will talk about this more. It's your time to ask us questions and uh, try to make the most of, uh, of your time. So we are here all about uh, developer productivity. We are talking about enterprise workflows that are critical to your businesses and uh, how can we do reporting? How can we do better unit testing and mocking? And how can we have absolute visibility in your network stack uh, with Fiddler? So we are here to talk about all things uh, productivity. However, it's not just this thing that we are doing. Uh, we started actually two weeks back, January 18th is when our first release of the year, R1, uh, the bits went out, uh, everything was live. And the very next day, you know, a lot of us, including Eve, were um, uh, in, uh, in our Sofia Bulgaria offices where our engineering teams are. We did a great, uh, you know, informal show walking around talking to our engineering teams and our PMs. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so again, um, anytime you uh, have a little bit of time free, come and join us on Twitch where we, you know, tinker and we build stuff. Uh, that's on Coded Live. And uh, like I was saying, this isn't uh, just the only webinar. Uh, this is actually the last one of the week for us because uh, we actually started last um, uh, week. Uh, there's a big portfolio of things that we release every, you know, uh, every release. And so uh, we, we have to take time to cover all of the things. So last Thursday was all things Teleric, which is most of our .NET tooling across web, desktop and mobile. Uh, and then uh, earlier this week on Tuesday, we had all things, you know, JavaScript, which is all of our Kinda UI libraries across, you know, jQuery and Angular and React and Vue. Uh, and today, drum roll, so we are here to talk about productivity, which is your reporting, uh, just mock and Fiddler. So, um, you know, we're here just trying to uncover uh, uh, and unpack all of the things that uh, our engineering teams uh, put together. We stand on the shoulder of giants, so we're going to try to do justice to all the things uh, that were put into this release. Uh, this was a big release. We had a lot of, you know, internal uh, changes, but uh, it's uh, something that the team got together and, you know, pushed out uh, a lot of, you know, features uh, in this release. We are you know, pretty proud of this. Um, so um, you do have a Q&A panel. Uh, like I'm saying, uh, you, you're giving us an hour and a half of your time, so make it count. Ask away as many questions as we can. The engineers who actually build these products are on the you know uh, back rooms with us, so they're going to be the ones answering your questions. If you're on the socials, uh, use the hashtag #HeyTeleric uh, to ask us questions. That way, we'll leave a breadcrumb. And you know, we are recording this in high def, so if you have to run or do anything, we understand. Come and catch it, uh, you know, on YouTube once it's up. Uh, and everything that we are saying, it's already out, uh, so you can you know go and get the bits and, and see what uh, we are talking about. Uh, this release, uh, like I said, it's about you know uh, trying to stretch across the platform boundaries and trying to give uh, you know developers and designers and everyone the right tools 
to build engaging you know, experience across all platforms. Uh, so every team takes the time to write up what's new in those products uh, on blogs.telerate.com. So take a look if you haven't. Uh, and you know, many of you uh, have our DevCraft bundle, which includes everything. Many of you have Fiddler. Uh, so take a look at everything else that we are doing. Maybe it'll just gonna you know, trigger something that maybe you should use something else that's already you know, in your portfolio. Uh, and everything that you know, Simona and uh, Rick show you today, those are all you know fresh new bits. So, however you get our stuff, go get the bits. You know, be it from NuGet packages, uh, you know, uh, through uh, you know the download uh, control panel, or just a straight up download. Uh, for Fiddler, it's just a different uh, you know installation experience. However you get your bits, get the bits. Uh, that's going to give you the latest release uh, you know features, uh, and that's what's going to you know light up once you uh, see uh, us walking through all of the demos. Um, we genuinely care about your experience. We do not want you to struggle. Uh, please talk to us. We have you know, support tickets. We have forums, uh, the docs. We spend a lot of time trying to make sure the developer experience is smooth. Um, and everything that we are showing, a lot of the demos are already out. So you can you know, uh, check out demos.tillery.com. If you want a feature that we just don't have, Talk to us, feedback.tillery.com. Like every team and their project managers, they're always, you know, listening to your feedback uh, and trying to, you know, build our next roadmaps. So we genuinely care, uh, try to care about your experience. All right, it's uh, Fiddler time. Let's start with Fiddler. That's where uh, Simona and Eve come in. And you know, I was talking to them. Uh, I was at a you know conference a couple of weeks back where we had a big room of maybe like 200 or so people, and I asked like how many people use Fiddler, and every hand went up. It's just such a you know uh, ingrained part of our developer experience, kind of grow, growing up with Fiddler, and now it's it's everywhere. Uh, so uh, kudos to all that the team has been doing. But let's uh, let's take a step back. Uh, um, maybe Simona or Eve, uh, tell me about Fiddler. If I'm just new to this, uh, what is Fiddler? I can weigh in there. Um, and I like how you did the segue, like Fiddler is everywhere, hence Fiddler Everywhere. Um, so that was a nice segue. But Fiddler Everywhere is a web debugging proxy tool, right? So this is one that works on Windows, uh, Mac, and Linux. And it allows you to inspect network traffic and uncover potential, you know, issues. Um, it allows you to run different scenarios. It allows you to work with your response and your request data to really find a needle in the haystack when you have a network error or something else that's you know throwing a code yeah yeah well said but i mean uh, to me like fiddler is so much more than uh, just trying to you know look under the network proxy it's just really everything for all types of apps uh, you know web and mobile and desktop it's for me to do like api composition it's for me to fine tune the performance of uh, of an app and like how does uh, you know, the rest of the team work with customers, like what's their experience like? How do we support, uh, you know, and, and triage defects that are coming in from uh, our users? So it really is, you know, all encompassing how much uh, we get done with network and, you know, support uh, developer workflows. Uh, and I know like you and Simona like talking about this, like it's, it's a big family. It's not just one thing uh, like we used to have with Fiddler Classic on Windows. Now it's, you know, Fiddler everywhere, which is truly on, you know, Windows, Mac and Linux as well. Um, do you want to talk about Fiddler Jam and Cap a little bit? Yeah, so with Fiddler Jam, that is a part of the Fiddler family, but that is a troubleshooting tool. So, so for support teams who are working with end users and clients, they need to reproduce an issue um, to be able to look at those logs, figure out what is going on, kind of reducing that back and forth communication, whether it be phone calls or via email. Um, it has powerful screen capture recording. Um, as well as the log analysis you, you can do. And the nice thing is, is that while they are separate products, um, they do work nicely together. So they do complement each other. You can use uh, what you record in Fiddler Jam and investigate it further if needed within Fiddler Everywhere. Yeah, and I love that Fiddler Jam is just a browser extension. I can just record yes. anything from any app. And once the user you know, is done, uh, I can just open it up in you know, Fiddler uh, Everywhere. And again, this is where like the triaging and the support uh, comes into play. Uh, maybe your devs, uh, dev teams don't need to be involved right away. You have you know several tiers of support. Um, so yeah, and Fiddler Core lets you embed uh, like the whole engine inside of your you know um, apps if you would like to. Um, so Fiddler Everywhere, like we have been saying, it's not just for developers. Yes, it's a core part of our workflows, but it's also for QA people. It's also for support engineers. It's debugging every type of app, not just web apps. Uh, and it runs on Mac OS and uh, Linux and Windows, which is beautiful. Um, so um, Simona, the team has been busy. Like if I pull from you know some of the base features that are there in Fiddler Everywhere, it's a long list. And I, 
I love some of the things like HTTP2 support. I love, you know, WebSocket support. Um, what's what's new and happening? It is long one, and uh, we promise that it will be uh, becoming even. Uh even more items uh, in there. So yeah, our latest uh, stuff that uh, we'll be covering today as well are definitely the new filters and the whole new uh, filtering uh, experience. Um, we will also be showcasing um, some um, like new functionalities that allow you to use already captured data from Fiddler to extract that, to save it or to copy it. Uh, copy it as uh, as a, your preferred code for format and to um, like analyze it further, um, use it in other applications, stuff like that. Uh, we will also be show, uh, showing um, our quick search improvements, uh, the, a way for you to limit this uh, session list that is uh, that you that is the first thing you see in the live traffic grid in Fiddler everywhere, and uh, yeah, much more much more things. Yeah, yeah, I, I love all of this automation. And I, I like the fact it's not just for me, like now I can share and collaborate, like Rick and me can struggle together while we're dealing with a uh, network. Because uh, I, I love uh, the, the ability to now save off my, uh, you know, filters that that's uh, you know, super helpful. Um, okay, so let, let's dive into this. So, so we are talking about Fiddler everywhere and some of the newest things. Uh, so the last time we talked, uh, this was, you know, during our R3 release last year, uh, you folks have had two major releases in between uh, that time and now. So we are at uh, Fiddler 4.1 right now. Is that correct? That's the latest one. But you already had 4.0. So uh, talk me through a little bit of this filtering experience that's new. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, definitely a very a, a, a feature that we spent uh, some time on to to improve it. So in short. Uh, we do have two uh, approaches uh, to filter on traffic. One is the um, column filters that can be accessed through the uh, column icon, the columns icons. Uh, the other one is was previously called the advanced filters, uh, and those two approaches were separate, disconnected, and it was causing some confusion uh, while trying to uh, apply some filtering. Uh, so now those two are much more in sync. They are combined. Uh, and whatever you apply on one side is this transferred to the other. And uh, we believe this removes the confusion and it's uh, much easier to apply uh, any filter, uh, filtering on the traffic that you want to, um, depending on the complexity that you want to do. Um, we do have, as mentioned, uh, copy requests is different formats. Uh, this is a functionality that is similar to the, you've probably seen it in the Chrome DevTools, uh, and it allows you to um, copy, to select a request and to copy, uh, copy it in your preferred code format, um, use it in, a, paste, uh, paste it in, the, uh, in your preferred code editor, uh, analyze, um, modify it, analyze it further, and just gives you that um, ability uh, out of the box in Fiddler everywhere. Um, I, I love, the, I love for, the fact that you can do like PowerShell and then curl and Python, even though I'm not smart enough to do Python, but like this can be my automation. Like I can write this out, uh, the request and response, and I can you know do this as a part of a script where I am I'm testing an API, and now I can just fire it off and just expect Fiddler to, you know, do the exact same request that went out. Yeah, uh, good note here. And also uh, the last one here on the list is uh, saved request uh, response or response body as a file. Uh, this uh, I'll uh, show it in a bit, but uh, this is visible in the request and the response um, inspectors. You'll see a save icon and we, you can just download um, images or JS files and just uh, work with them additionally in other application if needed. Nice, nice. Yeah, a lot of good things here. Um, so moving on, um, it, it, I mean, this may be something of a you know, benefit, but I can, I can see like folks who are maybe new to this. The first time when you open up Fiddler, it can be a little overwhelming. It captures everything in and out of your machine. It is truly a network proxy, and it's almost embarrassing, like how many times you know people you know call home like the big uh, tech giants, but it captures everything. So um, the limiting of the session list, uh, this is a way of kind of keeping our sanity. Is that right? Like I can limit how many I see. Yeah, that's a very good explanation. So if you uh, open Fiddler everywhere and you want to use the 
system traffic, it will uh, really generate a lot of traffic from your desktop apps, from uh, your web applications. And this, um, with the latest release, uh, you can now control this uh, session list, uh, sessions list length. Um, and uh, you can um, you can specify how many requests you want to see at once uh, visible in the live traffic grid, um, and uh, just uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and then you use it with the filters to really drill down to exactly what you want to see exactly. and, and no more. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I love it. All right, and um, looks like in terms of how I search for things in that list as well, there there are some updates uh, and enhancements. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this one it might seem not so uh, not such a major um, feature, but uh, we have definitely seen some issues uh, with the search, and uh, it was not applicable for all use cases. So it was not convenient for uh, every time you you had to um, search uh, some um, some content. So with the latest uh, release, this is uh, enhanced. Uh, and as you can see from the GIF there, um, it now highlights clearly where the um, where your matches are based on the keywords that you input in the search uh, in the search box, uh, and it also searches um, through um, all columns, uh, which means that if you have any uh, content that uh, you are not seeing currently you uh, see this uh, red icon uh, up there and if you click it it will uh, just review the um, mm -hmm. the columns that it's contained yeah in. i li like the fact that you are the search is now really looking through everything and you know not even columns that you may be seeing and this applies to me personally because like i would be running the same app but in different modes like i would be just just having a process that's only on my you know iphone or android and then a process for my you know desktop app but now i can drill down to say just show me what i want so i love that yeah. all right so moving on uh, more insight and i i thought i was uh, i mean i'm getting old i thought i used to be a hardcore developer and then you throw hex at me and this is really powerful but you know, tell me more uh, yeah, well, as uh, the name suggests, um, this uh, this new uh, body inspector allows you to see the hex representation of a body, and uh, this um, this helps you identify any hidden information or analyze uh, binary data. So uh, this was previously if you you if you had any um, information that could not uh, previously um, understand or analyze with the other with the other inspectors this is now available with with the hex inspector there yeah yeah more power like if you're tinkering with especially with like iot devices or you know raspberry pis and whatever you want to fine tune and understand exactly what's going across the wire uh, this would show you everything uh, binary it doesn't get any lower uh, than that um, okay, and looks like um, in terms of you know me comparing uh, different sessions and then how I see the timeline of each of the sessions, there are some improvements there as well. Uh, yep, that's right. Uh, we have improved the timing section in our overview uh, overview tab, and uh, when you select multiple sessions, now you can see the exact time of execution, how much time they took. Uh, you can see where they overlap, for example, which is the longest one, the, the shortest one. And um, yeah, um, I'll uh, show it a bit later, but you can further see some more details, which, uh, uh, which is contained in those drop down errors um, of each session. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Like, so, like you were saying, like especially if you're doing like load testing or if you're doing you know, a whole bunch of similar sessions, like are is caching working the way it is? Uh, that the timeline view is nice to be able to see. So yeah, good stuff, good stuff here. So we have talked through some of the features. These were, I think, uh, like you kind of combine all of the goodness that were in the last, you know, two big releases of Fiddler. Uh, so why don't you uh, show us a little bit? Um, so let me get you the presenter rights here so you can share screen. Okay, uh, so starting off with, with the filters, I can uh, show that first. Uh, and what I meant by the two approaches for filtering, uh, I meant that uh, the column filters are still available here uh, through this icon. You can, uh, if you have a straightforward um, condition and uh, you want to quickly narrow down on traffic, you can directly use this one, the more uh, simple uh, UI for um, 
uh, for narrowing down the traffic. Uh, and um, if you want to apply some more complex filtering, uh, you would then be taken to the open filter editor because here it, there is room now for only for only one condition. So you can access the open uh, the filter editor either from here or from here because, as mentioned, these two are now in sync. Uh, so if I open it from here, you will see that this condition um, is um, already visible here. Uh, I can add some more, for example, um, my method to be uh, to be equal to get, um, let's say, body size not empty. And one more just to really showcase. And uh, now, you, you, if you have, if you want to add some more conditions, uh, this is much more convenient through this dialog. So now I have, I can see that I have 96 matches here, and the traffic is filtered uh, based on my uh, matched uh, criteria. And one more thing that is um, very convenient, uh, in my opinion, here are these new checkboxes on the left-hand side. Uh, you have probably noticed them if you have played with the filters uh, recently. Uh, so this uh, is very convenient if you want to play with the setup of your filters, if you want to um, see the difference if you uh, add or remove a condition. So as you can see, uh, even the, the counter here changes and allows you to, to see how much... Uh, uh, what is the difference exactly? So this allows you to filter on traffic um, and to play with the conditions without having to delete the whole row uh, here, but just to simply check and uncheck any any checkboxes uh, from the filters that you have applied. Um, and Simona, I see a small button up on the top right. I love the saving part. Yeah, yeah, you noticed that. Uh, yes, it only made sense uh, to add this functionality. It uh, was very requested from our uh, from our users. So yes, you can now um, you can now enter a name here, click on the save icon, and this uh, filter will go uh, direct directly into the list of uh, saved saved filters. And um, yeah, this is very. Very useful, for example, if you open Fiddler everywhere, um, every day, uh, or you know that you, every time you open it, you want to narrow down the traffic, you want to remove specific requests or see only specific requests, and this is very useful. Um, you have quick access to your saved filters here. I'll disable now, but your saved filters can also be reached through here. So, for example, if I open Fiddler everywhere and I don't want to see the connects uh, at all, I can just quickly access uh, my saved filter from here and this will be applied automatically on the um, on the on the sessions in the grid um, a few more things we we've added uh, if you for example um, want to modify this current feature and uh, let's say you want to add some conditions based on the URL uh, apply you can oops uh, you have a save uh, button from here as well. So if I click that, this will uh, alter um, this, this filter. As you can see, there is indication that there are unsafe changes. So you can uh, easily easily play with the filtering, save uh, the filters as you as you would like to use uh, further. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, one more thing, <laughs> one more button here appeared, uh, which is the duplicate one. Uh, and uh, this is useful if you want to um, create a new filter, uh, which is similar to, to another one that you have, but you do want to have the two versions of the filter, let's say, so you can just click on duplicate. It will uh, be uh, by default as a copy. You can modify it, save it, and um, yeah, reuse it at a later point. Um, so that is on filters. Uh, the next one, which we have mentioned, is the copy requests in different format. Uh, I've explained a little bit uh, about the functionality, but uh, you can uh, access it uh, from here. Uh, if you right-click on selected session, you go to copy. Uh, previously, we had only copy as URL or full summary. Now we've added those um, for, uh, for additional formats. 
So you can easily uh, click on copy as fetch, uh, put it in the um, in the preferred code editor, and to quickly have like uh, quickly get to uh, edit it if needed, or analyze it, or, or whatever your your use, use case requires. So that is uh, yeah available available through this context menu. Um, the other thing that we also mentioned is the save the request and response body, uh, and this is um, this is uh, visible um, here uh, in the response and request inspectors body. You have uh, a save icon uh, appearing here, and when you click it, this will um, showcase you where you it will ask you where you want to save it format if you need to change it and if you click on save this will uh, save the data to a file immediately um, one more thing that we actually didn't mention on the slides beforehand but uh, i can briefly showcase is actually the um, improvement in the compare sessions tab um, we introduced uh, the option to see where some session from here, where it might be coming from, if it's coming from the live traffic, if it's coming from uh, a saved content that you have uh, captured before and uh, saved it as a session. So, for example, I can right, right click on this one, uh, review in the original list, and, for example, this will show me that uh, this uh, session um, is coming from a, a, saved, a saved session here and it will focus uh, which one it is coming from. And if I click on this one, it will, uh, it will focus on the live traffic grid because this is the source where, uh, where it's coming from. So I believe that is uh, very handy as well if, you, if you're uh, comparing uh, stuff and you're wondering why one is working, one is not, and you want to check if it's a newly captured session or if it's part from a saved, uh, saved content. So um, you can benefit from that if you, if you need it. Um, talking about uh, productivity, uh, it's, it's a time to mention the quick search here. Uh, and again, uh, for example, if I, type, uh, if I type something here, it will clearly show me where my, um, where, which sessions match uh, my criteria here. And uh, as mentioned before, you will see this um, indication icon that when clicked, it will reveal the, the column where, um, in addition, this key, keyword is contained in. Um, okay, one more, uh, one more thing that I can add uh, is um, the, the limit uh, sessions list. Uh, this one is available uh, in the settings menu, it can be configured from here, uh, from, the live traffic grid, uh, from the live traffic tab, and by default, uh, the application, uh, by default, uh, this option will be checked, keep, ses keep all sessions in the list. However, if you want to narrow that down uh, and have more control, you can uh, specify um, for the application to keep only the last X number of sessions. So, for example, I can put on 20 here. Uh, I can click on save. And if I remove now this traffic, and I'll try to generate some more to show you. Just a second. It's always fun to uh, um, do stuff live when you're messing yeah. with the very network that you're on. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, so yeah, it uh, shows uh, a lot less, uh, a lot less uh, sessions, and no matter like if no matter how much it's generating, it will always be have a limit. So you you see there is uh, this is the list length that I'll be I'll be seeing at once, and uh, if you choose to use this uh, option. Uh, basically, the newest sessions uh, will be appearing in the grid, and the oldest ones uh, will be disappearing. Uh, one more thing to keep in mind, if you have some uh, filters uh, applied, uh, you will likely see even less uh, sessions, uh, and that is because these, uh, these, these sessions are actually captured, but through the filters, they will be hidden from the UI, 
So if you're wondering why it's less, it might be coming from the filters. Um, and one more thing to keep in mind, if any of the sessions that was previously captured but now disappeared due to, due to this functionality, it will also disappear from the inspectors, uh, from the inspectors as well because it will not be, um, will not be visible anymore uh, in the live traffic grid. Um, and yeah, all of these, uh, we hope to, um, like the, the last, especially filtering, narrowing down on traffic functionalities, uh, we hope to really help you um, remove any uh, background or unneeded uh, sessions, really focus on, um, on the traffic that you want to work with. For example, you can uh, put filler everywhere on the background and uh, just uh, do, your, do your work and... Uh, once you go back in the application and need to inspect the last uh, captured sessions, uh, you will have just those um, visible here and you will no longer have such a long list um, to, uh, to look uh, traffic from. Um, yeah, very, very impressive. Uh, did you have any more things to show? Yeah, I do have a few more things. Okay, um, for example, yeah, we we showcased it, uh, we showed it, uh, briefly mentioned it, but um, we do. Uh, if you want to, uh, the hex view inspector can be uh, can be found here. Just let me find the uh, the hex view inspector can be found here, um, and uh, this is how you can um, you can locate uh, the the information that you might be analyzing. Uh, might need to analyze. Um, the other two, th the other two things is uh, these timing sessions. So, for example, if I select a few of those, um, first of all, I can see how much time each one took uh, and when it started, when it ended, uh, with this uh, new, with this new uh, view here. Uh, if I uh, expand uh further the the sessions <clears throat> i can see uh even more details and see uh the parts of this session and how much time each each part took so i have um even uh, a more detailed view uh to, to to analyze these sessions um and if you're for example if you want to look at uh such as are uh, are are short uh, you might benefit from this option here, the stretch session details, which when clicked, it will actually uh, showcase um, the, time, the, the timing uh, in all of the available say, uh, space, because previously it would uh, showcase the timings based on each, each other, uh, all of the other sessions. Well, if you use that option, you can kind of focus more individually on this one, uh, and it will not be based on the on the other sessions um, th that way. Uh, and last but not least, uh, but I believe this uh, brings some more organization into your into the UI. Uh, we introduced uh, with the latest um, release. We introduced uh, sorting functionality in the uh, sessions on the uh, sessions on the left hand side. So, for example, if I, um, it's, it, they will be ordered alphabetically, folders first. So, just to briefly showcase this, if I add a new folder and uh, put a name on it, it will automatically be moved um, down here in that case uh, because uh, it's, uh, it uses uh, this alphabetical sorting. And yeah, that's all. Uh, in, we have re uh, recently released, so we hope uh, we hope you can benefit from that, uh, and we we thank you for the um, the feedback that you share because we really want to uh, tie the experience uh, in Fiddler Everywhere to your needs and to make it easier for you, more productive for you. So definitely keep that feedback coming. Yeah, yeah, well said, and that, that's a lot. So I, I mean, uh, Fiddler yeah. generates just so, so much of you know passion because like we have used it for such a long time. So you know, folks, uh, we hope that all of this helps you be more productive. But uh, you know, and the team is working really hard 
Uh, so keep talking to us uh, and, you know, Simona and the team, uh, kudos to uh, such a, you know, a uh, huge set of releases back to back uh, and putting so much goodness into this. All right. Yeah, very uh, yeah. So let me um, steal the screen um, back from you. And uh, uh, before we switch, though, uh, there is uh, there's more, uh, more to come. Uh, so let's talk about um, what the future holds. Uh, you got some big things cooking. Uh, is that right? Yes, uh, we do. Uh, and these are just a few of the things that we are working on or will be working on. And for the full list of uh, upcoming features, you can definitely check our uh, roadmap page. Uh, but yeah, a few things to mention here. Rules grouping, uh, this, was, this is also a highly requested feature. Uh, and we uh, have been taking some time to really um, design it uh, design it well and uh, to be uh, convenient and to incorporate as much as many use cases as we can uh, so that you can benefit from that feature uh, and soon you will be able to uh, create groups put rules into groups we'll have a drag and drop you can we'll be able to apply some actions in bulk uh, like uh, enable disable and more uh, so yeah I'm excited for the rules grouping definitely yeah. I am really uh, looking thing. forward to GR GRPC. Yeah. Uh, I have loved WebSocket support because like now we're talking about a variety of applications, you know, folks are who are building like real-time apps, folks who are building mobile stuff, folks who are building microservices. Now we are catering to all of them. Yeah, uh, we will be adding GRPC support uh, very soon uh, and um, you'll be able to, to, capture, uh, to capture such traffic uh, and uh, see it visible in Fiddler everywhere. Um, so stay tuned. Yeah, the composer keeps getting better and, you know, just so much of love. I, I, I love the modern Fiddler that I can work on a Mac and I can work on Linux and I can still have so much of, you know, richness in terms of features. So. Yeah, Simona yeah, and, um, and, and the team, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so uh, no pressure after this, Rick. It's it's just a ton of love that's been poured into, uh, into Fiddler. I uh, love it all. And folks, uh, please keep asking questions. If you have anything that you want to ask uh, from the Fiddler team, now's your opportunity. Uh, we are here to you know answer anything. And you know keep talking to us, feedback.tillery.com. Tell us what you're looking for. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look to see how we, you know, reshape this roadmap if need be. All right. So thank you so much, Simona and Eve. Uh, let's uh, do a quick uh, switch of gears and talk about just mocking uh, and, you know, unit testing. Because, like, I test in production. Like, what's the big deal? I don't know why uh, Rick uh, wants more security and sanity, but it looks like most of you uh, do need this. So let's talk about just mock and, and what that can do. Um, so before you know, we kind of dive into this. Uh, Rick, tell me if I'm missing anything. But JustMock is our uh, approach to try to help you with unit testing. You know, when we are writing code, there are so many hooks that we do uh, when we are going outside of you know our app itself. We are calling into services, we are calling into databases, and within our app itself, there are so many things uh, that are you know a variety of you know methods, and you want. Uh, coverage of your code as you're going through releases. You want code coverage. You want more confidence every release that you're not breaking things. Uh, that's where JustMock comes in. So it takes the hassle out of you know unit testing. You get to mock everything from you know sealed classes to static methods and anything that you're doing outside of the app, any type of services, uh, and you can really have a nice debugging experience right inside of Visual Studio. And uh, you know, for every type of .NET app that you can think of, um, that's where JustMock just just fits. Very so, well said. Uh, yes. Yep. And uh, Rick, I just pulled out uh, a list of uh, some of the things JustMock can do, and it is impressive. Just the list of things it can mock, everything from interfaces, and like think about your code in in the way it interacts with objects and things that are outside of just the app itself, like your link queries and even within your code, you have your you know delegates or generics and extension methods. You can test everything. And any anytime you're going outside, like to your databases, to entity framework, 
uh, we can do all of that and very easy ways to assert and uh, try to see if your code is doing what it's uh, supposed to. It can work with just about every type of unit testing framework you bring to the table, you know, uh, MS test or N unit or X unit. And I also like the fact that, you know, we work with some of the other, uh, you know, uh, build tools because it's not just about, you know, building locally. Uh, most of us have like a CI CD pipeline. So are you using Azure DevOps or any other type of, you know, build system integration? Uh, we got you covered there. And, you know, lots of different tools, lots of different ideas where we work. Um, so, Rick, am I missing something here? Um, no, I mean, that really covers the full feature set of everything you can mock, but it also has some additional productivity tools built in. So, I mean, unless you're like Sam, where every line of code you write is absolutely perfect in every way, um, you might have some things to debug, including, you know, maybe even your unit tests. So there's built in um, built in test debuggers. Uh, with just mock is a built-in profile or this elevated mocking. And like you said, every type, every feature of C sharp, every dark corner that you didn't know existed, there's some way to to build a, a mock case for it. Whether you're yeah. using statics or seals or or simple POCO objects, everything can be mocked. Right. And and while the majority of you uh, and a lot of us, uh, you know, we cater to C sharp, we can also do a little bit of F sharp and PB if, if need be. Um, so Telerik Just Mock, as it stands today, I mean, it's getting a lot of love every release, and we are very, very future facing. We are not going to drop the things that we had in the past. Like if you are doing things on .NET Framework and Visual Studio, you know, 2019, 2020, we'll keep on working. But if you would rather be on the bleeding edge with us, we are right there with you. Uh, starting this release, uh, I mean, even last release, we have had you know support for preview bits of .NET 7. Uh, we now have full support for everything .NET 7 because .NET 7 is out production ready since November of last uh, year. So all of the modern you know, Visual Studios that you can think of 2022, we have full support for the tooling as well as the, as the runtime. Uh, so really impressive how much uh, the team can work to you know, get you up to the latest uh, you know, runtimes and, and tools. Now, uh, there are some new things in there. Uh, so uh, Rick, walk, walk me through this a little bit. So in terms of Visual Studio, like Visual Studio has, you know, plenty of, you know, bells and whistles these days, uh, but quick actions is something we are kind of used to when we, you know, try to do little things about, you know, uh, the little uh, bulb action that comes up, but looks like we can integrate right inside that uh, from just one. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that we initially built in R2 of uh, 2022 um, for very simple uh, public methods. And we've extended it to um, also include generic methods uh, in this latest release, uh, so a little more real world. And this is really great for someone like me who maybe isn't the best unit tester in the world. Um, you know, I might need a little bit of help, a little bit of uh, tips on how to formulate some of my uh, assertions. And um, this really allows, you know, just a, a, a perfect hint, you know, that's data driven and context sensitive at the exact moment when you need it. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, so is there anything you can show? Absolutely. Uh, I, I use that new feature and I use it to build a couple simple um, tests that we'll be able to take a look at. Yeah, yeah so to um, to show off sort of that new feature, and again, the lion's share of the work in this release was filling in all of the corners of .NET 7 support. Um, there was you know no end of work to making sure that continued to be fully functional for all of your mocking. This is, but this is a great productivity enhancement too that we that will be added. So what I did is I just built out a small mocking class. Is um, the text size good enough, Sam? Uh, maybe a tad bigger wouldn't hurt. A little, a little bigger. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Okay. Um, so I just have a simple class here. Uh, it doesn't really do very much. It has a flag which is instantiated to false. And um, I have a couple of methods, uh, do something, uh, which is uh, takes no arguments. And then there's um, the override of do something overload, which takes a generic argument. Um, so what this lets you do is um, once you have this set up uh, for your methods and you have other methods that will then call those. Um, so the basic idea of this is that you have a flag and when you call one version of do something, it gets set to true. And when you call a different version, nothing happens. So if we wanted to build some tests around that, scroll down here and see where I've already done a little bit of work, but let's say I didn't know exactly what to do. So we could go to our methods and start looking at the quick actions. And you see we have in the context menu, this create mock here. 
It gives you a little tip about how you might want to uh, start creating something. Here's an arrange. So if I hit copy, uh, I can copy all that code and come down and paste it into my test method. And I get the arrange statement, but I also get a little tip that says, you know, this is likely not going to work, you know, just yet because you have to mock the class too. So I think, okay, so let's go up and find, find the class and we can do the same thing. Go to the class, right click, go to quick actions, create mock. And we get another little tip here about how to create the mocked class. So we'll copy that code as well. We come back down and we can paste that in. And that gives you sort of the, the setup there for the, you know, the basic constructs of setting up a, um, a test using just mock. So I think like, uh, like Julia Child, I have a baked lasagna in the oven already. So we can uncomment a few of these lines here. So what this does is I have my mocked glass, which gets created. Um, and I do an arrange on this, you know, the triple A's of, um, of testing. Uh, arrange, act, assert. Um, first, I want to arrange uh, something for just mock, and I'm calling my initial do something method with no parameters, and that is going to set the flag to true. So that's the what I'm arranging. Call original means I want it to actually call the original logic of that of that method. Now, there's a ton of overrides in here. I can barely scratch the surface of things you can do. If I just do that. You can you can do nothing. You can um, call the original. You can return true. Uh, anything you might need to do uh, in order to arrange how you want your unit test to work. Now I have to actually do some action. So I'm going to call that method. And my assertion is that after doing all of this, uh, it should be true. That flag value should be true in the mocked class. Now, this is a relatively simple mock class. There's no dependencies. There's no um, data that's being stored other than a single Boolean. And something more complex like a data warehouse, um, having a mock class that is created just for this test and does not have any reliance on any other data um, or any state or uh, really makes setting up and running unit tests quite simple. So I think we can probably go ahead and test this real quick. I think we can right click and do run tests and open somewhere. So it's going through identifying tests and it's going to run them. Um, something else I've noticed with just mock is just how quick it is to identify, run, and um, return the value of these uh, of these tests. Other frameworks that I've used have always been a little on the slower side. And we see our test method uh, worked, which means that it actually set that value and was able to verify the assertion that the value should be true. And again, for someone who doesn't do much unit testing, you know, having the two most difficult pieces here and here pretty much given to me just in the in the browser and in, in the Visual Studio um, actions made this you know very very simple. Yeah, nice, so nice. We can do one more thing. So again, I was using the the standard. Um, call something, but the new feature we actually added is the ability to do same thing using the generic do something, which should be down here. And I'll copy that and we can see we get a different version of that arrangement. And argument can be anything. So there we go. Yeah, what I like is, you know, both with, you know, Fiddler and Just Mock, like we're talking about every type of app that you might be building, right? I mean, starting from, you know, web forms to win forms to, you know, uh, you know, Blazor and .NET Maui, what or Angular, React, whatever type of app that you are building, like the tools are there to try to, you know, help, you know, make .NET developers or, you know, even JavaScript developers more productive. So. Yeah, that's where we come in and, and just mock um you know like Rick said it works on all of the things all of the dotnets now including dotnet 7 so if you're on the bleeding edge building dotnet 7 apps uh you know be be sure that the tooling is there uh, to help you absolutely and that was just my little simple bench test but if you open up the examples that come with just mock you can see 
you know, the everything that is possible um, in the built-in examples, both under basic usage and advanced usage. Um, you could mock delegates, uh, private accessor methods, uh, all the different types of assertions, generics, matches, auto mocking. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, well said. All right, so Rick, I'm gonna take the screen back from you uh, one quick minute because there's something I think the team wanted to ask. Uh, so let's let's go back to me for a second and uh, let's make this uh, full screen. And essentially the team wanted to ask how uh, you are using it. So let's do a quick poll, to keep this a uh, little interactive. Um, so uh, while we are supporting you on all of the different IDEs, uh, we do want to know what you are using right now. Uh, like what type of ID are you using to build your apps right now? Is it Visual Studio on Windows, Visual Studio on Mac, which I'm a big Mac user, uh, but I, I, you know, vacillate between uh, either of those two. Or are you on entirely on VS Code? If you're building, you know, modern maybe spy applications, are you using JetBrains uh, or are you using something else? So tell us what type of ID you are using and uh, we'll see what we can do to help. So tell us in the poll, going once, going twice, and Let's see the results. This might be a mixed bag here. Oh, wow. Okay. So we are kind of on point because like, you know, uh, just Mark uh, kind of started out with Visual Studio for Windows and that's where most of the power is, but it's good to see that that's where you all are as well. And this is not a surprise. I mean, for most, you know, majority of .NET developers are on Visual Studio for Windows. So, you know, again, whichever Visual Studio you're using, uh, version-wise, uh, we are there to help. Uh, you know, 20, you know, 19 are back or 2022 and forward. So, uh, good to know that you know some of you are also using other IDs. So we'll keep our you know eyes and ears open. So whatever comes next. Um, all right. So, um, Rick, any last words on Just Mark? No, I don't think so. I mean, I've just scratched the surface of, of what it can do and my mind is already completely destroyed. Yeah, all right, good stuff. All right, let's do another uh, switch of gears here. And I know many of you on the call are kind of waiting for this. Uh, we, we try to figure out which ones we do first. Uh, some, sometimes we do reporting first, sometimes it's Fiddler first. Let's talk reporting because without reporting, your enterprise apps are going to, you know, crash and burn because like data is everywhere. We need to be able to make sense of the data. We need to be able to report on the data and automate the things. And that's where uh, we come in with uh, with Telerik reporting. Before we go into all of the things that uh, the reporting team has for you, another quick poll, uh, just trying to keep you, you know, um, interested and, uh, uh, you know, engaged. So uh, based on what you know with Telerik reporting or report server right now, uh, tell us, why do you trust it? Uh, and again, uh, this is prior to Rick showing you all the new and cool things that we have built, but what feature are you using the most? What, what do you like the most, right? Is it the embedded report viewers that you, know, can, you can show the you know, reports on just about every platform? Is it the self-service you know, report designers uh, that you can get on, again, a couple of different options? Is it web-based reporting? Is it a report designer? Or is it Visual Studio? Is it the standalone report designers? Is it the reporting model or the engine? Uh, so it's a you know complex question, but you know kind of read through it. Uh, or is it the report servers, uh, you know features that you need for automation uh, of how you build and deliver those reports? Uh, just just tell us uh, what what do you need or what do you use the most? What do you love the most? And uh, this kind of uh, also helps us try to see which way uh, we want to pour in most of our love every release, right? So going once, going twice, and Rick, do you have any, uh, uh, you know, um, guesses on where, what this might be? Um, hmm. I'm going to guess think... and say, oh, what was it saying? No, no, go ahead. I oh, to uh, your... if, I, if I had to guess, I would say the web slash desktop report designer. I mean, that's what yeah, I personally too. love. So me we'll too. see. It is so powerful. But let's let's see what uh, what you Ooh, folks are doing. Close. Oh, yeah. oh the dead heat. The, the report viewers are very, very convenient, though, so I, I understand. But it's true. also good to know that, you know, uh, you, you folks trust us for everything else, right? So maybe you're using Teleric UI for all of your .NET apps. Maybe you're using, you know, Kendi UI, and you want 
reporting to be a part and parcel of everything else that you're doing. It's just all together, all one big happy family. So good to know, good to know. Uh, you, you kind of, you know, uh, saw Rick and my inclination, like we really like the designers and how much work has been put on it, but absolutely the report, you know, the service generation, the engine, uh, and just the way you can, you know, view the reports everywhere, that that's a lot of power uh, for sure, for sure. All right, so let's uh, kind of dive into uh, what what is it that we're talking about. If you have not used, uh, you know, our reporting, let's do a quick, you know, 10,000 foot recap of what it is. It is a .NET based reporting tool that helps you build any type of report from any type of data source and be able to render that report and deliver that on just about every platform. Um, so we get, uh, you know, very advanced report designers. So more power to your users. They can do it on Visual Studio. They can do it in a standalone designer or they can do it completely web-based, which is amazing. Uh, so all of this power is there. And then you can integrate that with just about every type of platform that you're building your app on. And you can deliver this in a variety of formats. You can export things. Uh, and it comes with a lot of support and, and resources because, you know, we want to stand right there, um, you know, with you. Uh, it, now, it does say some things about the modern .NETs, uh, so I'm going to hold off on that because you may have read what it is uh, that, that it now includes. But a little bit more here uh, on, you know, Telerik reporting. It's, you know, four main pillars that we're trying to support. Be able to get to any type of data source that you have, so all of the, your data binding. Think about any type of data source that you want to bring to the table. We are right there to help. And then building it, uh, you know, you want WYSIWYG report, uh, you know, generation. The designer should be powerful enough to let your users build the reports exactly pixel perfect, just the way they want. And then be able to visualize those reports. Are you building a native desktop Windows app or are you building a web app? Are you building a .NET Maui app? So all of those things are covered and then be able to export that data out uh, through a variety of formats, CSV, Excel, PDF uh, for the most part. Um, so uh, Rick, am I missing saying something about, you know, Teller reporting broadly? Uh, broadly, no. I mean, it's so many things to, you know, so many different people. I mean, I've seen it used in uh, receipt printing, you know, in uh, mm -hmm. point of sale systems, uh, invoice, bill, uh, uh, bills of uh, ladling, uh, um, pack, packing slips, uh, dashboards. I mean, it's it's crazy the the number of things, number of ways you can utilize the tool set when it's you know so flexible to do just mix and match and combine, you know, whatever you need. Uh, Maybe even some you know interesting interesting reports we'll look at today. You know we'll expand some of the uh, some of the ideas of things you could do with the solution. Yeah, yeah, well said. I mean, you can have the fanciest apps in the world, but without reporting, uh, you just cannot work much uh, in your workflows. Now, whatever type of report you're building, you should not be you know. Uh, you know, held back by the type of, you know, things you can put on a report. So everything, everything UI component wise that you can think of, all of the richness of data visualization, it's all right there and built in for you. So you can, you know, throw whatever you need uh, on your reports. Now, you know, building reports and being able to generate and produce those reports and deliver those reports is one thing. But, you know, as Rick will tell you, this is not easy. The moment you start taking on reporting as a part of your workflow, you realize there are some things you have to do. You have to host things somewhere. You have to maybe you have you know uh, managers or you know your CEOs demand reports on a certain schedule. Uh, you have different types of authentication and authorization that you have to work with. So. Uh, you know, the whole report management thing is not, uh, you know, for the faint hearted. And this is where we come in as well with report server. Uh, this is a turnkey, uh, all inclusive uh, service that does, you know, it kind of builds up on uh, Telerik reporting, but then lets you do everything else that you need to do around report management. So, uh, Rick, what, what do you like most about report server? Just the simplicity of setup. Um, I, I usually tell uh, prospective customers that if they came to me at, you know, 3.30 on a Friday, I could have them up and running the enterprise solution of report server before end of business that week. Um, it really is install and go. Yeah, yeah, no, well said. Um, so report server kind of, you know, um, gains most of the benefits that Telerik reporting, uh, you know, gets. And so all of the same features about, you know, binding to whatever be your data sources and building your reports, visualizing, delivering the reports. But then when it adds on, is the management, like where are you storing your reports? Uh, do you have, you know, authentication and authorization uh, that you need to deal with? And are you letting your users, um, giving them the power to build their own reports uh, with data sources? And now uh, as uh, we get something new to cover, you can actually really share data sources really nicely between reports and then being able to export all of those reports out. So real automation and turnkey solution is what we're after. So 
Telerik reporting. First thing is uh, shared data sources. So Rick, tell us about this. Okay, so previous to this release, we had the concept of uh, shared connection strings or named connection strings. So you could take the connection string for a report and sort of pull that outside and reuse it based just on a name. And that gave you a certain level of obfuscation in your reports, a certain level of reusability, um, and you could have multiple reports using the same connections. But we wanted to take that a step further and really um, make it even easier to set up uh, shared data in reports. So we introduced what's called the shared data source. Um, and what this does is it completely abstracts the entire concept of data connectivity into a dedicated resource, um, an SDSX file, shared data source XML file, um, and that lives outside of the report entirely. So in a similar way to the name data source, you refer to these by name and location, but it allows two very, very powerful things. Um, the first is that a complete data source, and that's including um, all of the selection criteria, parameters, connection information, everything that would uh, retrieve and, and organize the data for the report is available externally and is available to be reused across multiple reports. So one thing to maintain, one, uh, one thing to update, and when it comes time for a report author or user, uh, report designer to create a report, they only need to know which data source to point to. They can be totally ignorant of any of the, the um, granular uh, connection, connectivity uh, methods needed. So it's a great way to sort of abstract that away from the need of the, the users. And that, that was probably the most common problem is that the, one of the most challenging things in reporting, if you're not, you know, someone who lives in your data is figuring out how to derive the data set for the report. This can be done, you know, quite simply now. And yeah. the other second major feature is it allows greater collaboration. Uh, two professionals who have focuses on two different areas, someone focuses on the data, someone focuses on design, can work together to build out a report library. Um, by one, creating um, external data sources and making them available, and the more design-minded person using those data sources to actually create the report. Yeah, so if I'm understanding this right, like, I mean, if I am the admin or a developer, maybe I set up a data source with all the connections with everything that you need to reach a certain uh, data source, uh, and then I you know, hand it off. Now, can my users do this from the web-based reporting uh, if I'm doing this as a part of like report server? This is actually a sort of a web first um, feature. So we rolled it out to the web-based report designer first for creating and editing the, um, the shared data sources. It can be used and consumed in the standalone uh, designer, but uh, currently it can only be created and modified in the web-based designer. Um, I think that's we, the most, you know, the highest use case, right? That's I where you want to give your users the power. We're seeing much, much more use of the the web designer, and it's really where we think the majority of our design work is going to be focused, you know, in the coming years. Uh, so, but you, going forward, you know, you will have both options available. But we started with the web designer. Absolutely. All right. So I'm sure you want to show this off, but let's cover a few more things that are in here. I yeah. love the native Blazor report viewer, and, and just I mean, Blazor is such a you know uh, easy sell for any .NET developer. It's you know C sharp front and back. What's not to like? You know, be it WebAssembly, be it you know uh, server side Blazor. But last release, R3 2022, we introduced a brand new report viewer, which is a native Blazor UI component that lets you render all your reports with full fidelity right inside of your Blazor app. Nothing else to step out, and it feels like Blazor because it is Blazor. Um, it is the API and everything, the way you set it up is exactly Blazor, but looks like there are some enhancements uh, to this one. Absolutely. And you're totally right, Sam. It, it is Blazor, you know, through and through. It's built on our native Blazor library itself. So um, I think there's next to no JavaScript in this entire operation, but brand new tool. So when a tool comes out on day one, you know, it's not necessarily completely hatched. Um, so we went and added a ton of great features. So we have infinite scrolling now in the native Blazor report viewer. So as, as much as you can move the scroll, the uh, mouse wheel down, you can scroll your reports for as many pages as you want. Uh, we added a context sensitive search. So you can search for keywords in the report. Um, back and forth navigation. That, that was something that's actually, you know, very important when you have a more complex report journey, which uh, we'll be looking at today uh, with 
reports that lead to other reports, which may lead to even other reports. We wanted to go back and forth in that 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 breadcom process. Um, we added some additional tool tips, you know, along the toolbar and in the report itself to make it a little easier on users. Uh, built in localization features to you know make it a more global um, uh, more global component. And the as we talked about a minute ago with report server, you now have the ability to connect the native report viewer to a report server instance and really bring the best of both worlds. So you could use report server as a complete report management studio and connect it to a native um, report viewer in your proprietary Blazor application. All right, sounds, sounds very exciting. I'm sure you want to show some of this stuff off. Uh, let, let's cover a little bit more. Um, okay. So speaking more on the uh, Blazor you know, report you know, generation and delivery, Looks like now it's easier for me to throw in a report viewer uh, for my Blazor apps. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't hard before. We gave you all the code and the documentation, but you still had to go find it and you know, Control C, Control V. Um, now you can right-click, uh, go to New Item, and select the native Blazor report viewer, and that will create the entire page for you with the default name. The wizard walks you through how to configure uh, whether you want to create a new um, create a new web service, point it to an existing web service. Uh, that's for the, the web services for the report engine, which actually does the, the powerhouse work of rendering the report um, or connect it up to a report server. It's all wizard driven. Um, and then uh, the default initial report you want to load um, is selectable via the wizard tooling as well. And that will just create the entire uh, razor page for you. And you can just drop that into any location you want and then begin any additional styling or you want around the report viewer on your page. Nice, so more, more shortcuts, so, you know, click, click, click and done, right? So yeah. Yeah, uh, good stuff. Um, now there is more. Code. We don't have to code no, anymore pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, let's see. Uh, all right, so if you again want to be uh, on the bleeding edge, we are right there with you. .NET 7 came out last November and we are here to announce full support for .NET 7 on Windows. Uh, I mean, it is, it's running on Windows. Uh, and this is true for any type of, you know, reporting piece that you're using. Is it the REST service that you want to host on .NET or is it the report viewers? Or are you, you know, bringing your WinForms and your WPF apps uh, over to .NET 7? Because this is the beauty of, you know, desktop. Now you can run them on the latest uh, .NET runtimes. So, so we got .NET 7 support for all things reporting on Windows. Uh, the report engine looks like it gets, uh, you know, some more improvements, uh, you know, uh, Rick, do you know, uh, or can you talk through some of this? Oh yeah, sure. So like you said, the, the .NET support on, um, .NET 7 support on Windows is, uh, you know, a major feature and this, it's supported across all of the things. So this sort of infinite diversity there. Um, the report engine improvements, this is sort of like the, the under the covers, you know, in, into the core of reporting and, um, there are actually some really great things in there that I didn't know how much I wanted until they came out. So uh, the ability to propagate data into a sub-report is huge. So basically, let's say you have a hierarchical data source and you have some nested data in a property. Um, in the past, if you wanted to have a sub-report that shows that, you would have to have a separate connection that returns only that child object reference to a parent key and have that sub-report have a separate connection string. Um, which means you're making two calls to a data source, you're loading your data twice, um, and you have to, it's, you know, that, that setup is a little delicate. Um, with, with this, what you can do with the new feature of the uh, data source property and propagation and sub-reports, you can pull all your data into your parent report, you can create your sub-report in the parent, and then using a very, very simple binding expression, you can say, take this entire uh, node of data and put that into the sub-report at runtime. So it'll take whatever might be in there, whatever might be in your sub-report, whether it be some, some mock data, um, some uh, design time data, uh, it'll take that, overwrite it, and put the real-time live data from your parent report into the sub-report without you having to do any separate connection strings, any separate data sources, and just run with that. And that can sort of be nested as many times as you need. You could have a sub-report in a sub-report in a sub-report. For as deep as your data source goes. Nice, and the conditional nice. functions. So, um, yeah, so what we added there was um, the, the one thing that I've kind of always missed having in reporting was a switch statement. So you can do anything with an if and an else, but you know, when you start having multiple conditions and you're nesting, you know, ifs and else's and expression boxes, 
it can get a little hairy when you have a lot of lot of things that um, you need to check. Uh, so we added a switch statement, which makes this process much easier. We also added a new um, if s uh, style of um, of uh, condition, which basically lets you test multiple um, predicates in one expression. So I believe a common example is if you wanted to take a, a numerical value and say return a letter grade, like a teacher, um, you could test whether a value is greater than 90, return A, and then test uh, if that doesn't if that doesn't pass, test whether that value is greater than 85, return A minus, and just sort of nest all of that into the one, one condition. And I believe we also did some improvements on the, the original if, that's if, if with two I's, and now it does a little bit of a lazy evaluation as well. So you're not checking every predicate, you're sort of checking them uh, linearly and saving a little bit of performance there. Nice, nice. And uh, the web report designer, I have always been amazed like how quickly it caught up to the desktop, uh, you know, uh, parity, uh, feature parity compared to, you know, Visual Studio or the standalone designer, but looks like it's gotten some more upgrades. Now you have your snappier, you know, grid lines and just mm -hmm. improved user experience. Yeah, exactly. And the team is really tilting into the power of the what you can do with the web and the the, the ultimate control sort of over everything that you want. In the beginning, it was, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily the greatest thing. So we had to build everything from scratch. But now we have that solid foundation. We can do anything we want with it. And one of the things we did this time was we added some more visual hints and cues around manipulating tables, uh, cross tabs. So the, the highlighting of um, of uh, disparate elements in a table will now get sort of a, a more um, accurate bind, uh, binding box to show you exactly which cells are being selected when you want to do something like move things around, um, copy, paste, uh, or change the size of, of items. So it's basically some more visual cues to make this a little bit easier for report authors working in the web, kind of see what's going on. Nice, nice. All right, and uh, just a quick, you know, shout out here. Uh, all of the cool things that we show you with, you know, with, with Rock Report Viewer, like this is, you know, closer to home side. And I, this was something we did last year, but I uh, last release, but I keep mentioning this. Uh, you can render things very nicely on desktop uh, if you're doing, you know, native WPF or WinForms applications. Uh, but you can also, you know, uh, tap into the power of Blazor if you're doing, you know, we have a brand new Blazor, you know, Report Viewer. You can combine that with .NET MAUI and be able to re uh, render your reports on, you know, mobile and desktop as well. If you are building, you know, modern cross-platform apps, uh, your report just shines, uh, you know, everywhere. Uh, so that's, you know, big uh, productivity boost in terms of, you know, uh, reusing your report viewers across, you know, multiple platforms. Um, so Absolutely. You, I, I love the interaction, Sam. Would, would you call that a, uh, a Blaui report viewer? <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you talked through a lot of things. Uh, why don't we give you the stage to actually try to uh, show some more things in action? Okay. Let me so move some windows around. You the presenter here. Okay. Let okay, me know your screen through. We do. Okay. Perfect. So I always try and build something, um, you know, a little bit interesting with with our report designer um, that shows up some of the new features. Uh, in this case, I in you know. A lot of our viewers uh, in the U.S. might know we kind of have a big sporting event coming up um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Um, it's going to be the NFL Super Bowl. So that kind of gave me the idea maybe there were some sports APIs that I could use to, um, to make some interesting reports. So my usual process is, you know, look online, see what APIs are available, open up Fiddler and start playing with them, seeing what I get back for data. Um, and I found one which returned a highly nested hierarchical data source of the various um, sporting events and the uh, upcoming events. And then if you were so inclined, the uh, various brokerage houses taking bets on those events and the odds that they're currently offering. And then to my surprise, this was all real-time data that I was getting. Um, and even more to my surprise, it was all free. So. I built out uh, something that I think might be interesting. So let's go ahead and launch the, I'm using the HTML5 integrated report viewer uh, in this solution. We have to trust Rick to build something cool and something on point every release. Be it Star Wars, be it, you know, uh, Super Bowl, Rick is on it. I'm kind of digging myself into a hole, Sam, because <laughs> now I have to go on something every single release, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, so this is the um, 
this is the initial report catalog you get with our demos. And I take I took this and I can say I have a sports bets report here. So I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and open that report. And you get this list here of various um, uh, various sports lists and teams that are available. So you can pick one, let's just say NFL and click on it. And it's gonna bring you to an entirely different report. And I'll dive into the report design uh, process in a, in a minute, but you'll take my word for how this is working here. Uh, so here we get the upcoming games and you can see there's really only one game left. So, uh, and when that game is expected to be played. And the- Are you, are you accepting, uh, you know, challenges from me and Eve as to who's gonna win? <laughs> I, I have no skin in the game, so you guys can have at it. Um, so you can uh, expand this list here and what I'm actually doing behind the scenes is uh, the um, various uh, brokerage houses, um, bookings houses uh, that are offering bets is a sub node uh, in, in this data source. So I am passing that entire sub node into a sub report, which is what you see here uh, for DraftKings uh, or uh, Barstool Sports, et cetera. Um, now under that, there was actually a out, I'm trying to remember the organization now, there was an outcomes tab, which um, gave you, I'm sorry, no, there, there was a um, betting tab, which gave you the various bets that are available, money line, oops, um, or a, um, uh, the, whether are you doing points or over under, and then under that, there was an outcomes, which actually gave you this table here. So we're looking at a three level nested um, report with three nested sub reports each one taking a data node from the parent and rendering it. And then the final sub node, um, instead of doing another sub report, I created a table and then took the, the, the last node in the chain and put it into a table. So that gives you this layout here where you can go in and you can see all of these values when they were last updated, which I'm not sure what time zone this is localized to, um, but uh, it was, 5, 15 p.m. in that local time uh, today when these uh, figures were last updated. And you can just take a look and see what different bookings agencies are, are offering for, you know, for, for some bets. If you want to make a, a, a friendly wager on the game, you can get an idea of um, sort of where the, where the economy was for that. But I realize not everyone is necessarily that interested in, um, in the NFL, so maybe we want to go back a little bit and let's, uh, I don't know, you're a big fan of cricket, right, Sam? So let's um, open sort of Big Bash uh, and see what's going on there. And I guess there's uh, an upcoming game with Perth and the Brisbane Heat. And it looks like, uh, it looks like Perth is actually favored to win. Um, if I'm reading that right, you can go back and yeah, do the there, same there's thing. There's something about these like leagues, uh, yeah, essentially it's like, you know, uh, club cricket where every franchise gets to you know pick their players and it's it's very exciting i'm I'm sorry to say i really don't think i even understand the rules very much of cricket but i'll let you teach me sometimes then um we can do the same thing for for nba uh let's see uh maybe the, the mavericks um and the pelicans let's see how they're doing and you get the idea of, of you know sort of how this works but I think the more interesting thing is to actually jump into the designer and I'll use the web designer and sort of show how all this was, was built. So let's see, I believe it's, one of these days I'll remember to bookmark this page. Okay, so the web designer opens to a default um, page, but you can go in and select the reports that you wanna look at, I believe under, open here, I have all the different reports and I wanna show something interesting. So for the, um, I believe it would have been the sports list was the first one um, that we looked at. So this is actually using, as you can see, the shared data source. Uh, so this data source here is not contained in the report at all. If I click on it and go to open for editing, it'll actually open up, uh, I might have moved something around uh, behind the scenes and broken that. Um, but it will open up that uh, SDSX file, which it, it should be pointing to for where the um, shared data source exists. Now, 
if you want to create a new shared data source from scratch, what I'm, I'll go back and I'll open up the original product catalog. This actually has an embedded SQL data source. So preview this real quick. And see, we have, we have a catalog here. Now, if I wanted to modify this one, this is an older report uh, that didn't use the shared data source. You can go to the SQL data source tab, click on the ellipse and go to save as shared data source. And that's gonna bring up this window and say that you can give this data source a name um, and ask you if after you create it, if you wanna replace the data source in the you know, existing report, which we will, and save and open, we'll create that shared data source as a file and open it up for editing. So you can give it a name, a description, and you can do a configuration on it. Configuration is basically as similar to a regular data source configuration. So this is where you would actually edit the data source um, and make any changes to it that you need. Uh, it's good enough as is. Um, so once done, you can go to menu and select save. This saves that data source to the resource folder, which is uh, what I believe I moved a couple hours ago, which I probably shouldn't have done. Um, it'll save that data source to the resource folder. And if I navigate back to the product catalog, it should now be using the shared data source here under the data source tab. So if I wanted to change data sources for this report, I could go here, I could add an existing shared data, data source. I can pick one from the, from the list here. Uh, I think I remember what I did now. Um, so here is the shared data sources folder. If you go up to the home folder, there might be some more data sources in there. Um, and you can select any shared data sources that you might want to uh, use in this report. So this is really a great way to, like I said, reuse data because now this resource is outside the report entirely. Um, if you look in the inline data, there's a, there's a separate data source which is used for the report perimeters, but ignoring that, um, there would be no data sources embedded directly in this report itself. It would be entirely referenced from that external location and it should still work uh, similar as before and load that data because it's just reaching out into that shared data source and pulling in the XML and rendering it that way. And that gives you an external resource that you can now modify. Now, what I also want to show is I'm going to open the, so sports detail. I really made a mess of this. Let me see if I can uh, if I can fix this real quick. Oh, and kudos for you to just tap into a brand new API and building a big uh, sports reporting based on just about every type of games there are. Yeah, <laughs> that was it was quite interesting, and I wouldn't be able to do it without Fiddler because I could really pick apart that API, see what the um, I'm going to have to stop the application real quick. See, after doing this live, training wheels off. Um, so I have my, my other data sources here, which I need to actually move back into the folder they're supposed to be in. I was trying an experiment earlier. Okay, now I have all my resources localized in that shared data sources folder. And I can relaunch. And while this app is coming up, uh, Rick, what, what type of app is it? Is it Blazor or is it ASP.NBC? Uh, right now, this is a, um, the, the report viewer is just being viewed in HTML and JavaScript. Um, so it's a Kendo jQuery based app. The back end is .NET 6. Um, okay. And um, yeah, so the .NET 6 app with a uh, jQuery JavaScript front end. Um, I'll be able to open, you know, the native report viewer uh, in a moment, and um, and show and show that uh, it's set up. Okay, and I didn't get any I didn't get any errors. Um, good. So now that I have my data sources in the right place, uh, you can see that you get the shared data source here and the uh, sports um, odds um, data source, which is uh, the one this one is using. And that gets reused or can get reused in various places. But I have the embedded, um, for this one, I have the embedded 
sub-report here. And if I go to the data tab and bindings, um, I know sub report one data source, you can see that um, I have one binding for the sub-report to the data source property. And I'm basically taking the fields dot bookmaker um, field from this parent report and sending it directly into the data source for the sub-report. Now, this is the um, bookings. So if I open that report, you can see that this is just another sub-report which has that information in it. And in here, there is another sub-report which does a similar thing. It's, it has the um, it has a table in the next one which gets its data from this one. And those nodes just keep getting passed from parent to child to um, grandchild to great grandchild without having to make any additional calls to my web service. Which, given that my web service was, you know, on a free tier and I have a finite number of um, of requests I'm allowed to make in a given day, uh, that definitely is one thing that helped me out quite a bit. Yeah, this is nice because like it's it's one thing to be able to share data sources across you know multiple reports that are you know disparate, but when you are having just a drill down report. Uh, you don't want to make those extra calls. You already have the data, just you know, propagating down to the you know sub reports. Absolutely, and it makes it you know much more performant as well. I was noticing as I was playing with it, going back and forth, how how fast everything is running. And if I go into, I believe the markets. This is the last. This is the last um, leg in that journey. So this is the final sub report. And here I have a table um, which gets the um, the child node. But I want to pay. I want to call attention to this field here, and that was because there was in the data there was actually no friendly name for the the various types of bets that were available. So if I open um, the if I open the statement here, and let's see, come on, I want to You can see that I was able to use a switch statement. I'm not sure if that's clear enough. Um, let me bang, bump that up. There we go. I was able to use a switch mm -hmm. statement in here on the fields key, and I'm checking the various um, properties that come into that field, and then I'm able to replace them directly in the statement with a friendly name, whether that be you know money line or the points or over unders or futures, depending on the different types of um, different types of offerings that were in the various brokerage house. So the API allowed for, for those types of um, bets. So I'm able to generate a friendly name in, in one statement. We could always do this, but it would not have been nearly as, uh, as pretty of a statement um, doing, a, you know, if this, then this, else this, then that, else this, then that. Um, so I am definitely a fan of the, of the new switch statement being used. Nice, very nice. Um, so, hey, Rick, we want to be conscious of people's time. So I think we got like two minutes left and some Q and A. Oh boy! Uh, any la any last minute things you want to show? Uh, yeah, I actually have one thing I need to show real quick, or uh, report team will get mad at me. Um, okay, so I have an unofficial feature to show off. Uh, let me close out a couple of things, save some memory. Um, so this is brand new. Um, and when I say brand new, I mean the new pack file was sent to me an hour before this webinar. Um, so we have been working extremely hard to bring the, uh, the Visual Studio Report Designer uh, to .NET Core, and we've made some great strides uh, in that. Uh, we're working closely with Microsoft um, on a new uh, WinForms um, designer, design surface in Visual Studio, and in order to bring this all to life, we have to use Visual Studio in experimental mode. Um, we have to sideload a different design surface because it's not official yet, um, and then build our tooling on top of that. So this is all very, wow. you know, um, I, I usually say the paint is still wet. The paint is even made in this case. You know, we're still building the uh, foundation. Um, no, no wonder you're in a VM. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was not doing this to my main dev environment because I said I have to actually change the design surface in Visual Studio and sideload unofficial, um, unofficial components in order to get this all working. Uh, but what I can do is I can show we have a .NET um, core solution here, and it uses, it's using the experimental version of Visual Studio, um, the unofficial uh, WinForms design surface, and I'm able to open a uh, regular TRTP style report in the designer. 
it's going to take it a second to um, to load it up and open. And um, <clears throat> so what this is is um, you know, a massive amount of work behind uh, bringing this forward because we are designing absolutely everything from scratch on top of something which isn't even done yet by Microsoft. So this is oh. one of our this is one of our standard reports. You can see we have the live preview is actually enabled. This data is coming from a SQL Server Express um, that I have installed on this VM. I can select um, items. I can change change the size. But the most important thing is actually the um, the preview tab. So if I just actually just uh, Come on, there we go. Like I said, this is all very, uh, I'm gonna do this in the properties window. Um, all of the paint is still very, very new on this. If I change something there and I just go to the preview tab, you can see it actually renders the preview, which it might not seem impressive, but this is actually the, the bulk of the work because what it's actually doing is going through the full deserialization object inflation creation process. The preview tab is a full rendered report. It's not not um, the design surface render. So it's actually going through the sequelization process to create this and doing the, the bulk of the work. So um, it's been a huge effort from the team to sort of to bring this to bear. Um, it's not done yet. We have a lot of work to do. The features it relies on aren't even out yet. <laughs> so um, but I did promise I would show the what we have accomplished so far. And we have um, uh, a number of the wizards and editors that are available, uh, the expression editor here, um, all the, the functions are loaded. So hopefully this will be done soon, um, but we are making yeah. great strides. Yeah, this is good stuff. Cause like the whole design surface thing, it's not easy. Like when we came over from, you know, .NET Core, uh, even like to .NET 6 and 7, it took a lot of work for Microsoft and all of its partners to, you know, get the design surface back to functional for WinForms uh, and, and WPF. So this is very good. It's definitely been a collaborative effort. Um, we made uh, quite a few good friends on the team at Microsoft who are helping us with this. And, you know, it's hopefully going to be official soon. So we'll see, we'll see where it goes. But major props to the reporting team, the the two Evans who who worked and built this, um, and uh, it's the level of technical um, discipline behind this is 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 far above me. Very cool, very cool. All right, so really good stuff, Rick, and you know the team. Uh, kudos for you know churning out good stuff every release. Uh, for the sake of time. Uh, 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 are, are you done, Rick, or is there anything else you wanted to show? Um, well, no, I don't think, um, yeah, I mean, I could go, go on for a couple hours. So. You, you can go on. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, think, I can tell. But I think let we me probably stop here. Yeah, let me take this screen back here uh, from you, because there are some um, uh, questions that we might be able to, you know, uh, answer. I think most of them have been answered in the chat rooms, but some we can, you know, talk through. Uh, and I think I might have a question for uh, even Simona, more like a feature request, you know, live on screen. Uh, you know, that's how we roll. Uh, but let's uh, go through some of the questions here um, from the chat room here. Uh, talking about just mock, uh, Rick, uh, Cesar Zapata was asking, is there any more uh, in-depth training videos? Uh, like, I know we have the virtual classrooms, but is there anything in there? Is there more, you know, training that one could have for just mock? Uh, yeah, the virtual classroom is really the um, where to get started with that. Uh, I believe there's a, um, a 15 or so part series on uh, everything through basic mocking through advanced scenarios, uh, which I utilize myself a bit um, in you know getting ready for for this demo. So definitely start there. And if that if you need something beyond that, um, you can definitely work with our partners and services team to you know um, develop some customized uh, training if you know if that's the direction they want to go. Right. Uh, now, I think I know the answer to this, uh, and, and somebody responded uh, from our team. So James Mead was asking if there are any plans to bring the web report designer to Blazor, or is it already possible? <laughs> well, uh, nat it's uh, it's already possible in Blazor. If the question is native Blazor, um, that will be a, a, a huge undertaking. So I don't think that is on the short-term plan. Um, but it can currently be leveraged in Blazor and by extension um, in Maui or Blowy, right. um, 
Ah. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Uh, so, and I think uh, uh, James responded to say that this is terrific because you, you can do all of this from any, you know, web uh, canvas that you can have. The web report designer you can render in your app. Um, all right, so now Nicholas uh, Downey was asking if there are any ways the developers uh, uh, to be able to create and manage shared data sources programmatically via an API, or is that something only users can do? No, actually, we do expose an API to um, to create the, the shared data sources, and that allows you to either create them on the fly, modify them on the fly, or to sort of lock down uh, who has access to them and uh, what they can do with them. So that's all in our documentation. Um, uh, I believe there's uh, some links to that uh, available from the uh, What's New page, and um, it'll walk through the you know how to how to work with that. Okay. At, uh, yeah. You know, at code time. It's always the best answer when we already have it. Good stuff. Okay. Um, Simona and Eve, uh, quick feature request maybe for me. I, I love the fact that, you know, when I'm using Fiddler, you know, the, the true power of it is me being able to bring in my workflows and exactly how I set up my filters, right? So I, I love the fact that now you're letting me save my filters and be able to easily manipulate those filters, bring them up. Uh, I also use the rules uh, a lot. And uh, can I be able to save my rules and be able to maybe share my rules with my team members? Yeah, uh, you're uh, actually be you. You can actually every every rule that uh, you you create, it is visible in the UI. I don't know if that you mean that that is what you mean by saving. But you can also share this rule. Uh, there is a button in the um, in the rules tab uh, available. There you can uh, type in the email of the person that you want oh. to share it with. Uh, you can also export the uh, export the rule so uh, this is available uh, currently and with the upcoming uh, improvements with the whole rules grouping uh, and everything uh, this will be uh, exposed even better so um short oh, answer wow. is yes okay. see i'm living under a rock i don't know the products myself uh, but so you're you're saying I can I mean it's I can see my own rules but you can say I can export them and maybe Rick can pull them up on his fiddler yeah, uh, we can import them. Uh, oh, yeah, export, import, sharing, that is all available. Oh, very cool. Just I name learned. them well, yeah. Sam. Name them well, okay. <laughs> all right, this is this is good, good to know. Um, all right, and uh, yeah, folks, uh, you have been, you know, answering or asking some questions. Hopefully the team got back to you. Uh, again, if you need to reach us, uh, use the hashtag HateLeric anytime. Uh, we are, you know, all ears, and uh, we would love to get back to you on a red tram trail. But again, I, I want to be conscious of people's times here. We are, you know, a little over because, like, we, we had some really good things to show here. Uh, so I uh, appreciate you folks uh, kind of sticking around with us. But uh, this has been, uh, you know, a solid hour and a half. Hopefully you can see uh, what Simona and Eve and Rick are trying to show you is the teams are working super hard. Uh, we are very conscious of your need to be productive uh, across your workflows, uh, whether you're doing, dealing with like network traffic, uh, whether you're trying to write unit tests and mocking, or whether you're trying to do reporting. We want to be right there to help you out uh, with the best possible tooling. So, uh, you know, uh, we stand on the shoulder of our, you know, engineers and, you know, folks who build these things. Uh, so a huge shout out to them. And, you know, tell us what you want. Uh, talk to us and we would love to be able to understand your needs better and be able to, you know, tweak the product so they serve you better. So, um, Simona, Eve, and Rick, thank you so much. Uh, you were very brave to show off some very uh, high-risk demos. Uh, everything worked out. So, thank you and appreciate uh, your time. Thank you, too. And yeah. have a great day. Yeah. Folks, uh, that's yeah, it from us. Uh, so thank you so much for hanging out with us. Hopefully this was, you know, beneficial to you. We'll put this up on YouTube as quickly as possible. But, uh, you know, keep uh, talking to us. You know the channels. And I uh, hope you have a great uh, rest of your day, rest of your year. Be productive. Be well. And uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. All right. That's it from us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Bye. -bye.